Thank you all for joining us um, for what I hope will be a fun hour. Um, you know, Wendy, this was, I had intended this to be a love fest because <laughs> you're um, a great hero of mine. Um, but then Paul said that I had to ask tough questions. So I want to make it clear that whenever I say something that's supportive and warm, that's me. <laughs> and whenever I say something that's critical, that's me just channeling Paul. Um, right. Just so got that out of the way. Uh, I, um, I wanted to start by, you're, you know, you're a very, in a very unusual position. You know, you're going to have this big conference in Washington this coming weekend where there'll be, what, how many thousand, 10,000 people? 10,000 people, yeah. Um, you have this enormous following and you're a kind of cult figure and I was trying to figure out is there any uh, recent historical figure that you think you are um, analogous to? I mean, feel free to throw off the restraints of modesty. Who um, else I mean, just to like be clear, you? though, the 10,000 people are coming together because they want to, I mean, because they're drawn to the same vision as each yeah. other. And they want to spend a day thinking about and reflecting on the incredible progress we've made in the last 20 years against what is a true crisis in our country, this issue of educational inequity and what more each of us needs to do individually and collectively to solve the problem. So it's not really... But you will be treated as a kind of rock star. You know what? The sad the reality that. is, I mean, maybe we would all wish, but, you know, there'll be my critics and my friends and it'll be fun, and, but, you know, it's not all a love fest. I, I was trying to... The closest analogy I could come, I could come up with was the Marine Corps, tough to get in, and then they send you to really nasty places, <laughs> right? And I was wondering, you know how in the movies, there's always that moment in those, that kind of movie where the one tough guy meets the other tough guy and they're staring each other down and they're about to get in a fight, and the one guy says, wait, were you in Nam?" And the guy goes, yeah, I was in Nam." Wait, were you in the Marine Corps? And he says, yeah, I was in 29th, you know, infantry, something, something, and they go, Semprify. And I wondered, is there an analogous moment when two Teach for America alums get together and they say, where'd you serve? South Bronx. And they go, South Bronx. And then they show each other their Teach for America tattoos. <laughs> but there is this, I mean, I'm joking, but there is a kind of, you are creating a kind of movement. I mean, the, 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 the Marine Corps alumni represents a kind of movement representing a certain yep. attitude towards the world, you know. Um, this is exactly the idea. I mean, this is the big idea, you know, and, and Teach for America really isn't about, we are about, I mean, teachers are critical, but Teach for America is about building a movement among our country's future leaders to say, we've got to change the way our education system is fundamentally. And, and I think, and your article in The New Yorker about, um, about the formation of movements just captured the whole theory of change of Teach for America. I mean, this is about the foundational experience of teaching successfully in ways that, you know, I think we're creating a core of people who are absolutely determined to expand the opportunities facing kids in the most absolutely, you know, economically disadvantaged communities, um, you know, who are pouring themselves into their work and trying to put their kids on a different trajectory and, you know, having varying levels of success and taking from that experience incredible lessons. You know, they realize through their firsthand experience the challenges their kids face, the potential they have. They realize that it's ultimately possible to solve the problem and that experience is not only important for their kids, but it's completely transformational for them. And I think, of course, they're all going through this together. And, and, and I think leave with, um, with a common set of convictions and insights and, and just a, a common level of commitment to ultimately go out and affect the fundamental changes we need to see to really solve the problem. How many, so you've got how many alumni now? We have 20,000 alums. And you, so you, you you consider your alumni to be as, as important as your active teachers, if you're thinking of it in movement yep. terms. Yep. How many alumni do you need before you think you have a kind of critical mass? Um, well, you know, you, I guess you never know, you know what will lead us to the tipping point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that just, you just bought yourself a good five more nice softball <laughs> questions with that. Um, 
I think, I don't know, you know, the, 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 this is growing exponentially at this point. You know, uh, a mere, you know, five years ago we had 8,800 alums and today we have 20,000 and if we can continue the growth trajectory that we're on, we'll have more than 40,000 by a mere five years from now. And I guess I look at what's happening in some communities where we have a critical mass of Teach for America alums. I mean, communities where we've been placing people for, in some cases, 20 years. Uh, New what's Orleans, that, in Washington, D.C in Oakland, California, in Houston, Texas, in, in any number of other places, in Newark, New Jersey, where very different things are happening today for many reasons, but if you took all the Teach for America alums out of the picture, I think you'd take away a lot of the energy and the leadership in those pictures. Does the Teach for America movement have um, an ideological personality? Um, I think that people come out of this, and, and you know, we probably have a bunch of, you know, we have a diverse community and people come into it viewing the issue that we're taking on in different ways and from different sides of the political spectrum. I think people come out of it sharing, largely sharing a few views. One, um, I think people come out of it knowing we can solve the problem. It's not that the kids don't have the potential and the parents don't care. I mean, if you look at Gallup polls, and I'd be interested in seeing another one now that, you know, I think the prevailing ideology has maybe started to shift a bit. Um, but as of about three or four years ago, most people in our country thought that the reason we had low educational outcomes was because kids weren't motivated in low-income communities and parents don't care. Our core members know for a fact that that's not true. They see their kids working harder than any kids work, and they see that their parents do care when they're you know, brought into the process. So they come out of it thinking, when the kids are met with high expectations, given extra supports, they do well. Um, and they also come out of it realizing that there's no silver bullet in this. Mm -hmm. Meaning, like, we're, yeah. We're gonna get to that. Yeah. But I still want you asked to answer the question. Um, I only ask it because yeah. whenever I see Teach for America um, spoken of in a derogatory manner, it's invariably by someone on the right, which confuses me because I would have thought it was almost, I would almost thought it was the other way around. Do you have a sense of this? Am I wrong in thinking this? Um, I doubt it. Well, you, I mean, you're saying most, uh, our folks are largely from the left, and we have, we have a diverse group of people. What percentage of Teach for America alumni voted Republican in the last election? <laughs> I don't know, I can't answer. Come on. It's probably, I'm, it's maybe not that high a percentage, <laughs> but I'm not sure. But isn't that, but quite apart from the comic value of that observation, yeah. isn't that weird to you? Why would it have an ideological dimension? Why wouldn't it be, why wouldn't you expect as many kids to be signing up for this who were diehard right-wingers as, it's, everything is consistent, surely, with, any, with all... Um. I mean, w w what is the profile out there of graduating college seniors today in terms of their ideological perspectives? I, I mean, what is the profile? Like, what percentage of them vote Republican? I, I don't know, and then it'd yeah. be interesting to look. I don't want to say, I mean, we get Republican folks too. It's tr I, I wonder what college students, what, what's their, I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I don't know if we're out of line with that or not. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, it's a minor. I, I'm sort of living maybe in a bubble, but you know, College, I, I don't know. I, I think we're drawing people. Uh, it'd be interesting to look at, at yeah. that, I guess. Let's go back 20, this is your 20th anniversary. Yeah. So when you reflect on the differences between, let's reflect on the differences between uh, 1990 and now. You, when we were chatting earlier, you mentioned how, which I thought was hilarious, how the movie Lean On Me could never have been made today. When yeah. was Lean On Me, by the way? Was that, that was not that, early That days. was one of the hit movies, my senior year, so 89 or so. Yeah. What is, what is it about Lean On Me that would be unmakeable today? Um, I mean, we put that movie, uh, or that school, the, the school in Lean On Me, up in lights. I mean, as a success story, and, and you know, it, the principal, you know, was kind of a superhero at some level. I mean, that was the point of the movie, and he, he really changed the culture of the school. 